education being a public good. And I thought, by the way, I have to say that listening to your governor and thinking of Governor Hunt, it gave me a modest policy proposal. It shows you how important governors are. And as a Texan, I have the following view. That every state, of course, should elect the governor. But then before they sit to their office, they should be randomly assigned to a state to govern. <laughs> and let me tell you, North Carolina would be the big loser. <laughs> My state, on the other hand, this is being taped. <laughs> so, the college readiness goal. Every child, college, and career ready. This is a tricky goal, and it's, but it's the right goal. What are the implications for our work together? Now, higher ed leaders love college readiness. They all celebrate college readiness. Why? Because it's framed in a way that suggests they have no role in making it happen. Right? The framing of college readiness, if we're not careful, suggests that it's a K-12 responsibility. Well, we're building a six-lane highway, and we have to make sure we're not building it into a swamp. Right? We need strong anchors on both edges. What's the national data about this? So, um, MAA data, Conference Board of Mathematical Sciences, show this is the first year where a third of all College, high, all high school graduates who go directly to college have calculus on their high school transfers. Tom Judson's studies of Japan and the U.S. show that our calculus students are as strong as Japanese's best suburban Japanese students. So students who take AP calculus in our high schools are not slackers. And a third of our high school graduates are, pretty, are doing something like that now. What happens to those students? Well, we now have data, thanks to um, David Pursuit at the Math Association of America. Half of the students who finish calculus in high school get placed when they start college in college algebra or below. A third of them get placed in elementary algebra after finishing calculus. A third of the rest uh, never take a math or science course when they start college. So the experience, basically, no one was calling them to mathematics and science and encouraging them to do it. That leaves a sixth, because I am a professor of mathematics. A deep knowledge of basic math is really important even today. So what happens to the remaining sixth? Half of them withdraw or fail their first college math course. We found that when colleges, higher education raises its admission standards and gets a more selective student body, there's no change in the grade distribution of the proportion of people who fail. This is really bad. Placement tests, a quarter of our early college high school students who've taken calculus in community college, when they have to take the state mandated placement test, get placed in an intermediate algebra when they start in college. After they've actually finished the calculus course on that college campus. We gotta be careful that in the end of the next 20 years, we can't boast that a full third of our college graduates are now college ready. Right? There's a fundamental mismatch here. What do we know about the students who are starting in elementary <coughs> algebra or intermediate algebra because of college placement tests? Well, thanks to Jessica Howell's research in California, they have a 3.1 high school average in algebra two. So we have students getting B's in high school right, who are being forced to repeat courses. College people like to think that this is because of weak high school teaching. And all the evidence suggests that's false. The evidence suggests strongly that upper level high school teaching is much better than university teaching. And there's a lot more time devoted to it. Except for me. <laughs> so what's going on here? Well, we did an experiment in, a, in the Massachusetts Community College. We had a whole group of kids coming out of Boston, which is like Charlotte, an aggressively improving school district. And they were placed in elementary algebra, even though they had pre-calculus in high school. Some of them had calculus. So we have a three hour, we decided to bring the kids together for three hours 
and before the first day of class, gave them the final exam of the course they were entering. And you can see we have film, we have a film. The first few minutes, the kids, I never saw this before. What is this? And like five minutes later, she said, yeah, I sort of remember that. I can do that. 20 minutes in, they're digesting it all. And by the end, they got almost a perfect score. And there's this beautiful guy. Community college faculty are not elegant. They're like my profession, we don't advance by virtue of social skills or tact. <laughs> <laughs> college math faculty. And this guy, really caring community college math faculty member, looks straight into the camera and he says, oh my god, they can do it before I teach it, but not after. <laughs> <laughs> This is what, in Texas, we call an Old Testament problem. Rivers of blood, locusts, right? Death of the firstborn. At every transition point, we have losing large numbers of students. 35,000 students in the fall semester in California community colleges were repeating a developmental ed math course for the fifth or greater number of times. I was one of the mathematicians 30 years ago who called for algebra for all. Who he ended up with is algebra forever for these students. <laughs> At the same time, students were repeating courses for the fifth time. We ended up in a situation where we turned away 144,000 students for lack of space. So we need new accelerated pathways. And it's exciting to see Sharon Morrissey and Scott Rawls working so hard on cleaning up that developmental education pipeline. I think they're going to be among the nation's leaders in this work. So these problems are not problems that you can solve in K-12 or just in higher ed. They involve new kinds of collaborations that we should celebrate. Hidalgo, where I work pretty intensively, my students now are district leaders, 90% of their students complete a college course as they end high school. Right? PSJA districts, we're seeing more and more places, early college high schools. In North Carolina, there are 12,000 students, 60% of them, <coughs> mostly first generation, complete their AA degrees, right, at the same time they finish their high school graduation. That shows you the capacity problem here is not the kids, right? The capacity problem is the systems we build to teach those kids. And what we're going to have to do now with the Common Core, with constantly rising standards, is create a new generation of respectful support systems for our teachers so that they can teach fourth year mathematics courses, third and fourth year science courses, to everybody's children, not just if not make it the province of a privileged few, which it has been historically. And no one should underestimate the difficulty of that. On the best days, teaching is a bitch. It's really hard to teach, right? And the public has very little understanding of that. I know this because I've had the privilege of having doctoral students study my own teaching. If you want real humility, have people looking at the every minute of your teaching. So my, one little story here, Michael Orton, about how hard it is to teach. One brilliant doctoral student videotaped my classroom and found five examples of me using metaphors on the fly to help students learn a difficult idea limits. Then he tracked those students throughout, and I was, I am good. <laughs> and then I, he tracked those students and found where every one of those metaphors later interfered with students' learning and wrote his dissertation on my failures as an instructor. <laughs> You look closely, this work is really hard, <laughs> right? And we need much better support systems for teachers. And that has to take place when none of the money is there to do the old kinds of things, which didn't work all that well anyway. We need a new generation of supports for teachers, and they're going to need to be involved in building them.